you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word as we read from the book of Psalms, Psalm 38, verses 12 through 15, and the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 27, verses 11 through 14. Now hear the word of the Lord. Those who seek my life set their traps. Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they plot deception. I am like a deaf man who cannot hear, like a mute who cannot open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. I wait for you, O Lord. You will answer, O Lord my God. And Jesus before Pilate in Matthew 27. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priest and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. This is the word of the Lord. Yes, thanks be to God. You may be seated. You know, a great question can change your life. You know, questions place us on a journey. But one has to ask the right question. Dr. Travis Bradbury is the author of Emotional Intelligence 2.0, and he says this. And this is not an endorsement of the book, by the way. But this is a good point. When things aren't going quite the way you'd like them to, it's often the result of not asking yourself the right questions. Some questions are hard to confront because you're afraid you won't get the answer you want. Others because you really don't want to know the answer. But the best things in life don't come easily and turning away from life's toughest questions is a sure path to mediocrity. Now, you see, asking the right question can be life-changing. As a young man, 19 years old, the right question for me came when my best friend's fiance, in a letter, told him she couldn't marry him unless he was saved. And we looked at each other and asked, what is saved? And even though it took several months before I got the answer, the question put me on a journey with Jesus Christ. It was the right question. And this morning, as we continue in the second sermon in our Lenten series, using Max Lucado's book on Calvary's Hill, we're taking a look at a life-defining, life-saving, life-settling question. And it's Pilate's question to Jesus when he asked, are you the king of the Jews? Because it's a question about his kingship. It's a question that's hard to confront. It's a question that some don't really want to know the answer. And if answered, it will most definitely lead to the best things in life and will keep you from mediocrity. See, in the story of Christ before Pilate, what arises from the question is at least these three things. There are probably more, but we don't have time. <laughs> at least these three. There's the threat of Christ's kingship. There's the testimony of Christ's kingship. And there's the call to trust Christ's kingship. So let's look at this, this text. Meanwhile, verse 20, chapter 27, verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Do you see the threat? See, Jesus is before the governor, a political figure whose task it was to represent Caesar and to quell any challenges to his authority. See, Pilate had already, he had already killed some insurrectionists because there were a lot of would-be messiahs and kings that, that popped up and, and Pilate was sent there to to handle this, he and, you know, Jesus alludes to it in Luke 13, uh, how, how one was killed that, and how the Tower of Siloam, he was slain. 
Jesus alludes to that. But Pilate, and also, you know, he, there's, a, there's a, one prisoner in jail, Barabbas. You remember him? He was an insurrectionist and a murderer. So Jesus here is saying, Pilate is saying, are you the king of the Jews? Are you a challenge to Caesar? Will you take down the emperor? Will you remove your people from this empire? You see, Christ's kingship is a threat to the political powers of his day. And we might add, he is a threat to the political powers of our day as well. See, this question is for political leaders of our time about Jesus, to Jesus, are you the king of the Americans? See, whatever your people group, the question is, are you the king of, it's a threatening question, why is that? Well, because the question says there is a king of kings. Hallelujah. There is a lord of lords. And the question tells them their authority is derived from him and limited. The question tells them there's one king to whom they must give an accounting as to the way they've used their borrowed authority. That's threatening. But the question also threatens us on a personal level, too, doesn't it? Because more than we care to admit, is we like to think of ourselves as kings and queens. Some people even call themselves that. And I understand, you know, what they're trying to do is boost their self-esteem or whatever. You know. But yeah, that, that's what we, we like to think of ourselves that way. In America, we're not used to having kings rule over us. You know, we are, we are, uh, we're like Pilate. We're the governor. We're the governor of our own lives. And Jesus' kingship threatens when we ask. We ask of him, are you the king of me? It's all right if you're the king over her or him. You know, they need a king. You know, but over me? Isn't it my life? Don't I have sovereign right to do what I think is best for me? Will I have to give an account to you as the king over my life? See, why does Jesus' kingship threaten us? Now, there's a lot of, there are a lot of reasons, but I think one reason is that the assumption is that, that you and I are good in our rule of ourselves. We're good over ourselves, though, if the truth be told, we usually don't have a clue. Yeah. We assume that, that we are good. But Jesus is not. In our minds, the query over Jesus' kingship is, are you the king of my pain? Are you the king over sickness? Are you the king over suffering? Are you the king over this cancer? Are you the king over my recovery, my loneliness, my wealth, my joy? And so on. Are you the king of trouble when it comes into my life, whether it's deserved or undeserved? You see, Jesus' kingship threatens because we doubt his goodness. And to subdue the uprising of our doubts, we need to hear the testimony of Christ's kingship. In Matthew 27, verses 11 and 12, meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. So there are two places here where we see the testimony of Christ's kingship. It's in his answer to Pilate and in his silence to, at the charges of the religious crowd. Because I find it interesting the way Matthew puts this scene before us. Jesus answers Pilate, but he doesn't answer the chief priests and the elders. See, Pilate didn't know who Jesus was. And so this Gentile governor is exposed by asking, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answers, yes, it is as you say. Now we can argue back and forth about Jesus' tone 
or the phrasing of the, the NIV versus the ESV versus the NASB. You know, those are all different translations of the Bible. But Jesus is essentially telling Pilate that he is the king of the Jews. Now, Pilate is exposed. But, but see, there's, there's comfort here. There's comfort for you, for you and I, brothers and sisters, in this interaction. See, because if you have doubts about Christ's kingship, hear his testimony in his answer to Pilate. Are you the king over my loneliness, my struggles, my... Uh, Hear Jesus reply, yes, it is as you say. As you don't listen to the detractors and the accusers, but hear the sound, hear the sound of Jesus' silence above the noisy calls of puffed up potentates. Because whatever your doubt about his goodness and his kingship, take comfort in Jesus answering your query. Jesus, the king, responds to the ignorant and the doubting. Hallelujah. See, the testimony of Christ's kingship is not only in his answer to Pilate, but it's in his silence at the charges of the religious crowd. Because verse 13 says, as Pilate speaks up, then Pilate asks him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? What was their testimony? In the, in the Gospels, Luke 23, you, get, you can see it, Luke 23, verses 1 and 2. Then the whole assembly, is referring to the chief priests and elders, rose and led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Christ, a king. See, why doesn't he answer them in front of Pilate? He had, he had answered them in Luke twenty two sixty seven through 71, where he says, if you are the Christ, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, would you not answer? But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you are right in saying I am. He just told them. Who he is? And then they said, why do we need more testimony? We have heard it from his own lips. Ah, no, they didn't want to believe. See, one could say that the reason, the reason that, 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 that he didn't answer them is because they are trusting in their own ideas. They had their own agenda. They have their own brand of righteousness, thus rejecting his kingship and and that would be reasonable to deduce from, from the text. But the reason the scripture gives us is John 18, 32. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the kind of death he was going to die, would be fulfilled. Ah, you see, yeah, scripture has to be fulfilled is what, the, is what the Bible says. Over and over again in the Gospels, you see that phrase. This is done so that the scripture might be fulfilled. You hear that over and over again. So in the testimony of his silence, we see Christ the King, yet he's fulfilling his word. He's in complete control. And the scripture must be be fulfilled is what the Bible is telling us. Our Old Testament reading in Psalm 38 verses 12 through 15 is that, is that is, it must be fulfilled. This is, this is Jesus. Those who seek my life set their trust. Isn't that what happened? Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they plot deception. I'm like a deaf man who cannot hear, like a mute who cannot open his mouth. I have become like a man who does not hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. I wait for you, O oh Lord. You will answer, O oh Lord my God. You see, as he waits on his God and Father, he's like a man who doesn't hear, whose mouth cannot offer reply. See, his actions matter more than his words. He offered no self-defense because he was becoming our defender. He couldn't give an answer to the charges being brought against him because we can't give an answer to those that are brought against us before God's judgment bar. See, if Jesus had spoken here to save himself, then we wouldn't have an advocate before the Father speaking for us now in heaven. We are called 
brothers and sisters. To be more than religious, we're called to follow the king. And his silence, it indicts the religious self, the self-righteous crowd. And it frees those who place their faith in him. Now, upon hearing the testimony of Christ's kingship, you know, there's a call to trust. There's a call to trust in Matthew 27 and 22. Because as you hear it, you know, does the, does the testimony of Christ's kingship taking on unjust punishment to free the undeserving demonstrate to us the kind of king he is? See, his testimony reveals he's much more than the king of the Jews. But he is the son of God. It's a Pilate's second question in verse 22. What shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asks. It's a crucial question, isn't it? And as Max Lucado says, you have two choices. You can reject him or you can accept him. You can journey with him. You can listen to his voice and follow him. Why? He's more than a king. He's more than the king of the Jews. He is the Christ. He is the king of everything and every one. Spurgeon speaks so eloquently of the value and challenge of Christ's kingship. He says, there's no attribute of God more comforting to his children than the doctrine of divine sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances, in the most severe troubles, they believe that sovereignty hath ordained their afflictions that sovereignty overrules them, and that sovereignty will sanctify them all. There's nothing for which the children of God ought more earnestly to contend than the dominion of their master over all creation, the kingship of God over all the works of his own hands, the throne of God, and his right to sit upon that throne. On the other hand, there's no doctrine more hated by worldlings, no truth of which they have had made such a football as the great stupendous but yet most certain doctrine of the sovereignty of the infinite Jehovah. Men will allow God to be everywhere except upon his throne. They will allow him to sustain the earth and bear up the pillars thereof or light the lamps of heaven or rule the waves of the ever-moving ocean. But when God ascends his throne, his creatures then gnash their teeth. And when we proclaim an enthroned God and his right to do as he wills with his own, to dispose of his creatures as he thinks well without consulting them in the matter, then it is that we are hissed and execrated. And then it is that men turn a deaf ear to us. For God on his throne is not the God they love. They love him anywhere better than they do when he sits with his scepter in his hand and his crown upon his head. But it is God upon the throne that we love to preach. Hallelujah. It is God upon his throne whom we trust. Now, you see, trusting Christ's kingship is, is to trust him through the stuff that happens to you as you follow him. Why? Well, because the king knows how to form the image of Christ in you. For Christ, trusting turned trouble into triumph, didn't it? See, trusting turned trouble into trial. It is, isn't that what we are seeing in Psalm 38 when, when people were setting traps to talk of his ruin, but he's waiting on the Lord. And Peter writes this in, in 1 Peter 2, 23. When they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. I don't know what you think about you know, think about this because you know as as as, as you, you know, I've, I know you've gone through things in your life I've gone through things in my life you know, uh, you know if if you're living you're going to go through stuff <laughs> you know, but are you praying are you praying to be released from some suffering and does it seem that that God keeps saying no to your requests. How do you know? How do you know that the pain that he is not delivering you from right now isn't saving you from something worse befalling you? How do you know that the pain you are, are suffering right now just might be 
the greater deliverance that you and others need most. Wait on the Lord. You say, Pastor, that doesn't make sense. You need to look at Jesus. Look at, look at Christ. He, he, look at, look, isn't that where he finds himself unjustly charged with a crime? Isn't that what, isn't that what took place? And he waits on the Lord. Because you see, the king knows how to deliver his children. He knows how to develop the image of Christ in you. He knows how to turn trouble into triumph. It's why we come to the table of our Lord. For in the table of our Lord, the question of Jesus' kingship is settled. <laughs> he is the king who enters our suffering and gives up himself in order to save his people. You see, he's not a Marvel character. You know, he, 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 he doesn't don a costume. He puts on flesh. He's just like us. He's made like his people. He takes on flesh. He's not protected by what he wears. He suffered. He didn't kill his enemies when he had the chance. And he had the power to do it. But he takes on suffering as one who, who has the power to transform our pain and us. He transforms suffering and makes it an instrument of his salvation. Hallelujah. See, this is what we see in the communion. That the threat of Christ's kingship is answered by the testimony of Christ's kingship since his goodness is evident in his death for us. And this enables us to trust him as our king, as the king over our lives. So brothers and sisters, if you settle the question of Jesus' kingship, you will settle the question, you will settle every other question in your life. Does it come to the table? Behold your king.